you, everybody. In the name of the I Am Presence and the Ascended Masters and the Ascended Host, uh, thank you for coming together and talking about the, the activity and uh, where there are people together talking about the activity, the builders of form and the angelic kingdom are uh, building a forum above us and uh, taking all of our good energy and dropping it into the the, the form. So uh, thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Scott Guthrie, and I wanted to let you know kind of how I got into this activity. So um, I was uh, in my 20s, um, being a person of, in their 20s, and um, I was working at Ohio State University as their film person and living in a small little apartment in a place called German Village in Columbus, Ohio. And um, all of a sudden, the idea of the meaning of life came to me and for no reason. And I would take these walks and think about the meaning of life. Didn't have a clue what that meant, but I would keep taking the walks and thinking about the meaning of life. And then I, I was prompted or I thought in my mind to, to maybe I should learn how to meditate. So I bought a book on meditation. I got still, I kind of did the breath thing and that was all good. And then at some point I realized um, I'm not going to learn this in a book. So I threw the book away mm -hmm. and I started to meditate um, for real, really not knowing how to do it, just decided to do it. And I became such a good meditator on the weekends and I didn't tell anybody I was very uh, quiet about this um you know the masters say to to know to dare to do and be silent is really their their mantra their motto and that was always important to me still still is the number one thing um but um I learned how to meditate I got to the point where I was meditating two or three or four times every day on Saturdays and Sundays and I was doing it for like, you know, two hours, maybe three hours each time. Um, so spending the whole day in meditation and wasn't telling anybody. And to, to, for me, it was like traveling without packing, right? I was experiencing all these things on the inner and all these things were happening to me. And yet I was not saying a word. And it got to the point where I would, um, I'd, I'd meditate, I'd get still, and again, I, I didn't know kind of what I was doing, but I was doing it a lot, right? Um, and I was having all these unique experiences where I was um, raising my consciousness at different levels. And at each level, there were things happening, light, lights. At one point, um, at one level, you would taste words, you know? You would think about words and you would taste them. And then in other words, uh, another level of bell would go off. I, I've never uh, understood why the bell or what the bell meant, but there was a certain level, there was a bell. So I got to understand these levels of where I was, right? And I was being, the way I looked at it, I was being taught on the inner. So I was being taught and um, I was shown uh, the book Treatise on Cosmic Fire by Alice Bailey. And uh, believe it or not, that's the first book I ever bought and read. Well, didn't read. I read. I read a page and a half and think about it for a week, right? And try to process it. And there, you know, it's like a thousand pages, and it's really intense. And the word logos, there's like seven different terms, ideas for the term logos, and you had to kind of figure that out and everything. So um, I'm reading uh, Treats on Cosmic Fire, and I'm trying my best to kind of figure out what in the world this is, and I need to know this. And so, and I'm meditating, uh, not telling anybody. And a woman uh, decides to take an internship for six months in my office, Office of uh, University Communications at Ohio State. And her name was Lillian Zarzar. And she was very unique, very unique. And sometime we started talking, we started talking about spiritual things. I don't know how we got on the so a subject. And I told her some books that I was reading, Trees and Cosmic Fire, or maybe some other books that I looked at. And I said, what books do you read? And she said, I read these white, yellow, and green books. And that's all she said. And I was like, well, that's not anything at all. What, the, what does that mean? So it, it was in my consciousness, right? And uh, I used to go to this bookstore, this incredible bookstore called Phoenix Bookstore in Columbus. And it was a library. It was not a bookstore. They didn't care about, you know, selling books. But it was a library of great information, right? And it, it was just wonderful. It was a house. 
And um, I would go up there a lot and I'd walk through the, the stacks and I'd feel out the books, right? And try to get a prompting from within about what book maybe I should look at. And she said the white, yellow, and green books. So the way I tell the story and the way I remember it is this way. I was walking down a stack and a book fell in front of me. And it was a seventh ray. And it was a white book. And it said the seventh ray. I knew about the rays because of uh, the trees on Cosmic Fire, right? The Alice Bailey work. And I took it home and I read uh, six pages and bawled, just knowing that this is what I was was looking for. And I read the book and read the book and read the book and read the book the whole weekend, multiple times. And I ran into my office on Monday and I went to Lillian and she knew instantly, excuse me, what had happened. And the fact that there was a change in me. And I said, I need to know what the white, yellow, and green books are. Excuse me. Well, this doesn't happen a lot. Mm -hmm. and um, she invited me over and she showed me all the green books that she had, all the yellow books that she had, all the white books that she had. Um, and she said, the yellow books, the author lives in Colorado and you can go visit her. So I think that week I called Alice and Alice said that she was having some kind of get together. And that just meant that people from around the country, around the world, would go and hang out with Alice for maybe a week and be around Alice, right? And she would talk. And Alice, Schultz. Alice Schultz, yeah, ADK Luck, okay. uh, who wrote the Law of Life books, nice. right? So I went out there, and I remember the first time I met Alice, um, very quiet, um, in her, what, late 70s, um, 80s. And um, she had these cute little dresses that people would give her and they, I think they were probably from the 30s, right? So she would wear these dresses and all that. And she was getting still. All these people were talking in the room when I first met her. And there was a gentleman talking and talking and talking. And I thought, well, that must be her right-hand man because he's doing all the talking. And it wasn't, I found out. But um, Alice was getting still. And she used to get still when people would visit. And people wouldn't really recognize this most of the time. She would get still and try to get a prompting on what these people maybe needed at the time. What was the subject? What was their kind of question? You know, what can she do to uh, assist these people on the path, right? Um, so that's how I got to know Alice. So, um, and I was going out and going out and then I moved out there. So let me get into who Alice is in the background of Alice. And, uh, and then I'm going to go into a little bit of the nuances of uh, decreeing because Alice was the ultimate decreer and she really knew a lot about the inner workings of how um, the qualification of energy during the, the during the uh, decree process uh, happens. So and not, not, not a lot of people maybe heard that. So I'll get into that. This is uh, during the I am activity. So um, Alice was given a book. Uh, I'm guessing it's Unveiled Mysteries. I, 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 I don't know if that's the case or if it was Magic Presence. I think it was Unveiled Mysteries. And she was given to it in a, in a kitchen and she took it home and she looked at it right away. And within just a few pages, you know that the first chapter, it sets everything up so nicely when St. Germain starts talking. She got into that part and she just kind of knew, right? And early on in her life, she always knew that there was something different about Christianity that, that wasn't explained, right? That it was different than what, you know, the Bible said or what other people said. And one, one time when she was young, uh, during Christmas, she was uh, sitting there by the tree and they had all the, you know, the tree, uh, the Christmas tree. And they said, she said, she mentioned something about Saint, uh, not Saint Germain, about Jesus. And Jesus appeared and didn't say anything, but he appeared to her. And she knew that he was real, that um, something about his resurrection and just kind of, it kind of, you know, opened her up to certain things to get her ready. And this was when as she was a child, this happened. And it got her ready for the later activity, I think. And she always just occasionally would mention that. So she started, um, once she got into the green books, the, um, she went right away. <laughs> she went right away and found out about the Ballards, 
found out that they were traveling in a caravan and they were going around the country giving talks and you know doing whatever they were doing right so she got involved pretty much right away she went to one she said look i'd like to somehow you know caravan with you what can i do to assist you so she became the person that would uh sell the books during maybe an intermission or afterwards and occasionally mr ballard would sign or you know whatever and she would sit there and that was her responsibility so she was with the, with the Ballards for really maybe early 1936 until 39 with Mr. Ballard. And that was her thing. She, she helped out in any way she could. She sold books in the lobby after the event. And she became the secretary for the activity. She was such a good note taker. Uh, she was Swiss. So very much like Werner yesterday. <laughs> um, they have this organization structure that's amazing, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and what's interesting, she's the twin of Joa Kuhl, A.D.K. Locke. And Joa Kuhl is the one master that knows all the hierarchy and the people, the, the individuals, the Senate uh, masters and cosmic beings of the hierarchy. He's the one that people look to for. He's the one that basically understands that one of the best. And it was interesting that she is his twin because she was so good at that, too. You know the structure of the hierarchy. So she took great notes during the live events. She had little uh, note cards that um, she had a study, and it was and she wouldn't really let me get into it when she was uh, around um, because that was her place, right? And I was very cognizant of that. Um, but she had this these notes from the '30s, and she had notes on everything. It was just amazing the note taking she took during this caravan time, you know, when Mr. Ballard was giving talks and all of this. And she had little things that he would say where somebody like Werner would call up and say, hey, did Mr. Ballard ever say this? And she would go into her notes. She kind of knew where it was. And she said, sure enough, you know, here, here it is. And they would, they would con converse. Mm -hmm. She saw that one of the things was occasionally they would take a break. And as a group, they would go out and do something, get off some steam. And one of the things they did was they saw a movie called The Wizard of Oz when it came out, when it was in the theaters. The only movie ev Alice ever saw was The Wizard of Oz in, in a theater. Only movie, I think probably ever. But she used to tell this story where there are all these people and they were trying to find seats. And she got um, a seat and Mr. Ballard came around this way. So she was sitting next to Mr. Ballard. Uh, during you know watching the movie and when the emerald city came up he said that's very very similar to the temple of truth on the inner but that was that was her cute little story you know mm -hmm. the main thing with alice she always wanted to be behind the scenes you know she didn't want to be the big shot at all i'll show you in her decree book on the front saint germain says something about that she got a lot of personal letters from the masters and i'll talk about that a little bit later that was during the bridge but that was her big thing is to be behind the scenes, not be the big shot in front. She helped write the I Am Activity Fundamentals. They were trying to basically create a basic idea for people coming into the activity of, of things. With, so they would have a, a really good fundamental class on the basic understanding of this teaching. And she, she developed that. She was a perfect person. She just knew so much about the activity and so much about the law and the inner workings of the law, right? And that's what was that's what I learned that that uh, I think most people haven't had the chance just because being around her, she would talk about the you know energy being qualified and all these different things. And uh, I'll get into that a little bit later. But she wrote the fundamentals. She was also in the meeting where it was decided during the I Am Activity after Mr. Ballard made his uh, transition or ascension that um, the the fundamentals should be, people should have to, forced to uh, do the fundamentals twice a year. And she instantly knew that energy came from the solar plexus and not from the heart. She saw it. And she um, knew instantly that that was a bad decision. And the re reason it was a bad decision is it's a waste of time. If you have people that already know this teaching, spend that time doing personal service. 
right? Rather than having them, forcing them to do this fundamental class that they already kind of understand already. You know, she was there during the card carrying member thing. And uh, one of the things was, and people maybe don't understand, is that the masters wanted to keep um, the United States out of World War II, right? It was, they, they felt like that was not the, the right thing to do. I don't know if this is true. This is um, something that I remember Alice talking about, but this was her uh, idea that Mr. Ballard, when he made, but right before he made his transition, he had a big wound on his, on his leg. And she was believing that maybe he was trying to take on as much energy from the war or all the energy that will start the war to try to stop it. And I don't know if that's the case, but she would talk about that. And always like she and I would kind of talk about that stuff. Uh, and then Mr. Ballard gained his ascension in 1936, but he waited until 1939. And here, here's the thing is that when he gained his ascension, so he easily could take his ascension, but he waited until 1939 to build the root system of the IM activity. It, because if, if he would have taken his ascension, which he could have, it wouldn't have the base that it needed to be established, right? Mm -hmm. So from 1936 to 1939, that was the majority of the impersonal service, the decreeing. Uh, the decreeing was basically brought about by St. Germain. Um, he moved the, um, the spiritual impetus from when they got the dispensation for 20 years of the original I'm activity. It was really one of the last chances for the earth to stay in its orbit. And so they, they had 20 years, uh, a certain amount of energy, uh, from let's say 1932 to 1952, and they moved the the idea from the east because all the energy was put in the east, uh, meaning India and and things, right? And it was moved to the west because the west is of action. So the process, because of action, the impersonal service using your voice in rhythm in a group does wonders, right? And again, I'll talk about decreeing later on, but that's that's why all that happened when the occult law was lifted to get this information to Mr. Ballard and then build this activity. Uh, once the occult law was lifted, um, the impetus, the idea that the it used to be the individual come, comes first, right? And the whole comes second. That was completely switched when the occult law was lifted. Now the whole comes first and the individual second. The great thing is, is that by giving and working on the whole as a group, you're working on the individual, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. So that was important, and maybe some people haven't thought about that. Certain individuals wanted to gain uh, access to the IM leadership group to break up the IM activity. So I don't know if you you read about this. There were, there were some individuals that St. Germain was trying to assist mm -hmm. to keep them out of trouble. Yeah. And so he brought them into the IM activity and they tried to get on the staff, right? I think in, in, they were involved with music and they had a lot of history of nefarious things. So he was trying to give them uh, a way in which to assist the light and kind of keep them out of trouble. And what happened was they tried to force them themselves on the staff and that's what really did a lot of harm to the IM activity. So um, after uh, Mr. Ballard made his ascension in the end of 1939, uh, Mrs. Ballard kept it going, right? And for a while, it was, it was fine. They were decreeing. They were going around the country. Uh, Alice and some group, group members would stay in hotels or wherever they had to stay to do whatever they want. Eventually, though, um, something happened where... Um, Mrs. Ballard got the idea when the two people try to get on the staff and all these nefarious things try to hinder the IM activity, Mrs. Ballard, trying to protect it, wanted to make it um, a card, merit, card carrying membership, right? She also basically stopped the uh, selling of the books outside of the membership. So the books that were supposed to get to the world, whoever wanted them, stopped, right? And the masters knew that that was, that was kind of the end of that. But 
remember the masters lived by the law and there's a law that they were given a dispensation for 20 years. So they had to wait until 1952 to start a new dispensation, right? Because they lived by the law and they had this 20 year dispensation and you just can't, you know, willy nilly. So um, that's what happened. So, but they knew when all this started to go and they were closed, the IM activity was closing in and becoming a, a closed thing. Um, that's the last thing the masters wanted. Alice knew that there were changes happening, but they didn't know where to go. So they were hanging around, not knowing where to go. They were still decreeing and doing all of that, but they also knew that something was going to change. They didn't know what, but they, they knew something was going to change. So in 1944, um, El Moria came to Geraldine Innocente, and Geraldine Innocente was the daughter of, uh, was it Mary Innocente? And she was a, a really good IM actor. Uh, guy am activity uh, person. And so Geraldine was involved in the I am activity at a young age, right? Geraldine was also the twin of El Moria. And she had had many embodiments um, as a Delphi order, right? The order of the Delphi. So she was very good of tuning in, you know, for higher vibrations. So they worked with her with personal um, things, right, on a personal level, and then um, in maybe uh, 51, maybe 52, um, Alice, Alice had heard the rumors were somebody else was getting messages, right, and they didn't know what to what degree, but the rumor was around, and um, she checked it out. Um, I don't know, the masters at that time sent out letters to Mrs. Ballard, multi, you know, Mrs. Ballard, and all these different um, leaders of spiritual groups, uh, Christian Science, Monitor, you know, all these different groups, and none of them, you know, went. But they did that. They did that. And Alice at the time, I don't know if she was prompted or got a letter. And anyway, she decided to, to go with this group. She she read one of the um, dictations and she got a feeling that it was coming from the same place, right? And has the same quality, right? And so she decided to go with the Bridge to Freedom. And so the masters got another dispensation of energy from 1952, to, let's say it's 20 years, so 1972. And they started this group activity. So they had all these individuals from the 1930s who had all this um, experience with their I am presence, with decreeing, all these with acceptance of all this material, and they got going quickly. And what they would do is they set up uh, decree groups and they also set up a publisher and they were publishing, you know, uh, a variety of things. And so they also got new information out um, like this chart. Oh, no, sorry. The, uh, the chart of the presence from the original Mayam activity, it has the, the rays of the causal body around the presence, but they didn't know, they didn't know all the colors of the rays or the order, right? That was one of the things that came out. Um, but there's all these other things. Um, the bridge, the masters worked very quickly through Geraldine. And Geraldine was this sweet little soul that took this on and they would show up at 4 a.m., right, ready to go. And they would work uh, for, I don't know how many hours, and she would uh, get all this kind of information out. And it came through her, it came through, uh, how do you describe that? I think it was visible light, Sandra, was that? No, that was, that was, uh, that was uh, Mr. Ballard, but she was, she was more audio, you know, inner, but whatever, however she got it, the quality of what was being said really sh shined through, okay? And that's that's what really mattered. It's not like how she did it, but, which is an interesting process, but it the, the, the Ascended Master words and vibration came through. And it was, if you read it, it's, you can tell it's from the same source, the same quality. Um, so um, Alice went with that. Um, there were a lot of things that happened. Um, you know, one of the groups that uh, was really in charge of the bridge 
was the Philadelphia group. They called them the 100% Club. And it, Mrs. Eakey, Frances Eakey, was the, um, the leader, right? The group leader. And um, I don't know if you know history of uh, Mrs. Eakey. She's the one in the, uh, in the history of all of this that I've always wanted to meet. Um, she was an archangel. There were two archangels that fell, and me fell mean, meaning they opted to take embodiment to help mankind at the time, right? Now the issue is you have this being that has a lot of uh, a lot of feeling and a lot of energy more than what a normal person would have, right? So you can do good if you keep your attention on it, or you can get your attention off your presence into all this other stuff. And where your energy, where your attention is, that's your energy feeding into it. And they they fed both Mother Mary and who was an archangel, and uh, Mrs. Eki, who's the twin of Archangel Michael, fed their energy in and got and had to go through reembodiment, right? And um, but Mrs. Eki in the bridge was given this great opportunity to serve like no nobody other. She had this group of twelve to fifteen people called the 100% Club, the Philadelphia group. And they did so much um, application that the masters had this big uh, stockpile of energy. The way the masters work is they were given dispensation of energy to start this activity. They are responsible for every electron, every atom of that energy. If it is not used wisely and they run out of it, they have to make it up. OK, so what happened was the bridge was doing all this impersonal service through decreeing. Right. Because that's the thing that St. Germain came up with. And they they created this huge stockpile. OK, so, you know, just to let you know, again, the masters use the law. They live by the law and they don't sway by it. So Mrs. Eki was, you know, again, this archangel. I can't imagine being in a group led by Mrs. Eki, an archangel with a feeling body of what she had and how much energy in a positive way that is. I just can't fathom. I try to get Alice to talk about it. She would really never talk about it. But that's the one person I think was just so interesting. And it's that Philadelphia group, 12 to, 13, 12 to 15 people that would meet in a rhythmic uh, fashion, like every Wednesday or whatever. And because they did it in rhythm, they said the same decrees, it builds repetition, which builds energy and energy and energy, right? And the reason it builds energy is the fact that when you give a decree and you say it multiple times, there is a, a chalice, a vessel that is made by the builders of form, right? That chalice is already built because you're saying that repeatedly, it's a strong structure to feed the energy into during the decree process, okay? And then that, that energy, is uh, protected by an angel. And it's that angel's um, protection. And then they basically have that to use, right? And that's kind of how it works. Um, okay, so uh, in the bridge, as I said, they were, it was happening so quickly that um, it was quite a toll on um, uh, Geraldine Innocente, who again was this sweet soul, not really made for this, but but she chose to take it on, right? And they knew it was going to be a short time period and they had to get all this information out. So we learned about all the masters and cosmic beings that we didn't know about in the IM activity. We um, knew about the rays. Um, I asked Alice one time with all the stuff that was coming out during the bridge and it was going so fast and they knew it was going to be a short activity. Is there anything the masters said they might talk about that they actually didn't get to? And she said there were two things, sand and left left-handed people. And they never got to that. Um, okay, so what happened is that the bridge, um, just like any the possibility of any activity, what happens in if you're giving in personal service, um, life says, Oh, you're gonna give in personal service, you're giving more in personal service. So what life does, it brings back more misqualified energy from your past embodiments to requalify and transmute, okay? That's the grace that life gives you, right? But you have to do personal decreeing, do a daily decree to keep that violet flame and 
sword of blue flame and bombs of blue lightning and all of that in check. So the, the Brits of Freedom people uh, didn't do a good job of that, okay? There were three people that ran the bridge. It was like a triumvirate. It was um, Mrs. Eke, it was Geraldine, and it was, I think, Mary Booth's, I think. I always forget the third person, but it's, it's somewhere. And uh, what happened was, um, in 1958, this is how Alice told it, and I, I go with this too, is that at some point, there, the personal application wasn't done, the misqualified energy was too much, and it broke the, in, the inner, the triumvirate was on the inner, right? And it kept, it, it was like, it kept the bridge together. And at some point, the misqualified energy became so much that it broke it, and there was a change, right? And Alice kind of felt it. Now, they, the bridge kept going until really 1961, until Geraldine Innocente uh, made her transition, okay? But Alice kind of looked at it as like late 58, early 59 is when the actual bridge on the inner broke. And I think she saw it from an inner perspective. She saw like something like breaking or something. She she kind of somehow knew that, right? And she said the decree, and not decrees, the dictations were changed in some way, right? Now, I don't know if that's the case. And there were some great dictations after 58, 59, um, but that's what she would say. And who received the dictation? Uh, Geraldine. Geraldine. Geraldine, yeah. Um, she and they would they would come to her at four a.m. and then work for hours, and it was just exhausting, you know. But again, life—if you're giving in personal service, life through really grace wants to give you as much as you can handle, so it quickens the pace of the ascension, which is the goal of life, right? And you just have to keep up with personal decreeing or personal, you know, decrees, usually every day. One of the sweet little stories is at in 1953 or 54, um, a lot of these individuals in the bridge were twins of Ascended Masters, um, Katumi, Jesus, um, you, you name it. And they were, that's why it was so powerful, because if your twin is ascended, you're being, you know, it's you're, go, you're going up, right? You're being kind of pulled up. And there's a lot more you can do because your twins ascended. So a lot of these people, um, their twins were ascended. They didn't really know at the time. They had an event on, on Valentine's Day in 53 or 54. And the people that didn't know, uh, the bridge members, they were, ha they were handed uh, Valentine's Day cards from their ascended one. Oh, and Alice had one from Guahul. <laughs> Um, and that was a cute little ceremony. Also, there were in the bridge, there were um, all the members or quite a few um, during the Revolutionary War were involved in the Americans or the uh, British side. Right. So there's a bridge in um, the East Coast and they had the Americans on one side of the bridge. The masters asked them to do this. So the, the Americans during that embodiment got on one side of the bridge. The British, during that embodiment, got on the other side, and they came together and shook hands in the middle of the bridge. And it has some kind of inner cosmic thing to, you know, take care of that that misqualified energy. So, um, to tell us, tell them what you told us this morning about King George III. Oh, okay. So uh, again, Mrs. Eke is this fascinating individual, and uh, she had, you know, again many embodiments. Um, and again, as an archangel, you're wielding a lot more power than a normal person, which can be great, but it can also uh, hinder and you can create misqualified energy. So one of her embodiments was, is it King George? The third. The third, yes. The Mad King during the Revolutionary War. So she was on the British side. <laughs> she was on the British side. And, um, and not a lot of people have talked about this. I'll mention it. Um, is that, um, again, what happened was the archangels um, came down, the two decided and opted to come and get embodiment. And uh, if they got misqualified, which they got off task, they had to start re-embodying. And so one of the embodiments, um, Mrs. Eke, because she was an archangel that fell, 
um, was the idea of Lucifer. All right. Now, Lucifer's ascended. So, you know, but that was the idea of Lucifer. So I don't want to stay on the negative on that, but um, um, so this is really important. There were some dispensations that happened in the 50s because of all the work that was done, the impersonal service that was given, and the big stockpile of energy. And one of them was, you. it used to be that you had to um, get rid of 100% of all your misqualified energy, right, to make the ascension, which is unheard of. You know, the, people were ascending one a year at times, right? Nobody was ascending and these people were going into caves trying to get a feeling about their I am presence or whatever. And again, they had to go within and, you know, understand all this. But um, what happened was because of the dispensation, because of all the great work uh, that happened in the bridge, there was a dispensation given that the master said um, that it went from 100% to 51%. So life was saying, you clean yourself up to 51%, just over 50%, and you can gain the ascension if you choose, okay? Also, there was another dispensation given. So if after you embody, um, if you, you can also gain the ascension on the inner, which is a lot easier to do, right? Rather than physically here, because it used to be you had to do it physically here. Did you have a... Yeah, I, I'm sorry. So my understanding, Scott, is that so in the ascension, there's everything has to be um, purified. So they can leave their physical bodies um, after 51% or whatever, but they still have to go into the inner temples and purify the rest and set all the life they've ever um, harmed or hurt free and balance their um, their use of life at, at the, in the violet plane temples. Mm -hmm. Well, this is this is so if somebody's let's say let's say they're they had to be a, a, basically a student, right? You had to know about your I am presence and all of that, and you had to give them personal service, right? And you had to kind of know things already. So you were you were a student. And if the if the student passed on, um, they were able to work from the inner to gain the ascension. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and now they have the atomic accelerator, and now now thousands of people are ascending, right? Or, you know, getting close to the ascension. Where, as I said before, it was like maybe one or two people a year. And that was it. And they're always from the I am work. Well, again, um, you have to, if you're going to gain your ascension, you have to be aware of your own individualized presence. And you have to use like the violet flame. And it's only because those are tools in which to gain your ascension. Right. So at some point, whatever your background is, you have to be aware of your own individualized God presence and the tools, the violet flame, to get that done. And can I ask you, Scott, the difference between personal service and impersonal service? Yes. So uh, personal service is doing decrees for um, your protection and your transmutation of energy for you. Right. Now, here's the thing if you call to your I am presence, you're in reality calling to all the I am presences, okay? The impersonal service is coming together as a group and doing it as a group, knowing you're a group, right? And giving decrees at a, as a group. So that means it's very important to physically go to your group when they're meeting. Well, you, I think Zoom, you know, I've had, um, I've had thoughts about this. I think Zoom works too, because you're still doing it at the live, Right. basically and the timing and it's and again i'll talk about that a little bit later but um yeah that's the difference the the personal is you do it by yourself right and the impersonal is you decide as a group to come together and give impersonal service for the world right. you know and basically cosmically so yeah the personal is basically self-service yeah um yeah um it is um what's interesting though as i said when you call your presence the God presence in you, you're actually calling also for all the God presences in the world. Now, I don't know what degree that is happening, but that is that there's some aspect of that happening. Alice tried to get the Law of Life books uh, published when she was in the bridge and they didn't want to do it. And her reasoning for this was the I Am Activity books were closed, right? Nobody could get them unless you were a card carrying member. And so they were trying to get people in the bridge 
And they didn't have a good base, an understanding of this, this teaching, right? Um, so she decided to put together the Law of Light book. She had them ready, and the bridge wouldn't publish them. So after the bridge broke, around you know, late 58, 59, she would author her own and have them published, right? And that's Law of Light, book one and two. And again, her whole reasoning was these people are getting into that activity and she could see that they just didn't have a basic understanding about certain things. And she wanted to make books that were very uh, plain and concise and kind of to the point about certain things. One of the things, uh, interesting things about Alice is that, you know, the law of conservation is one of the laws and she would use old envelopes uh, to write notes and things on, right? And they'd be all like all over her study. And uh, she also, and I don't know which book this is, she um, wrote a book on old envelopes, sent it to the printer <laughs> and said, print this. And they did. Now, I don't know how many, how many uh, like, you know, letters went back and forth, like, what do you want? You know, but that's, that's what happened, right? She would, um, so that's one of like the cute little things that she would do, you know? Um, I, I know that, you know, um, Alice was in her 80s and uh, she and I would get after like the, um, oh, like weeds and stuff, uh, tumbleweeds. She had tumbleweeds in her uh, driveway. She had a long driveway down to her house and her house was like on 40 acres in no man's land in Colorado, right? A beautiful house, but it was just like in no man's land. So we would get out and take care of the tumbleweeds and she'd be right there with me. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd have to keep up with her. And I had to go, I had to stop occasionally and go, she's like 80 something years old and she's just getting after it. So that was definitely Alice. She, when she was, she was born outside of Portland, outside of Salem, Oregon. And she was born to, you know, Swiss family. And they had, I think, uh, three daughters. And she was the daughter where the, the father would get her out in the fields and she would work with her father out in the fields. And the other daughters would be, you know, in the house. But she was the one that would just get her hands dirty and work and work and work. So. Was oh, she, was she ever married? No. She wrote songs, too. Yeah. Yeah. She wrote yeah. So songs. there's a song book and I typed them all out. There were 300 and we have about 100 completed. And then there's a YouTube channel all for the songs. And. And I've been wanting to do it for a while, and I never got the okay from certain people, so I just did it. And um, what's so great is you don't need the book as a group. You have just the music right there, and you can sing with it, and you see the lyrics and everything right there. So it just it, it's an easier way to get together and during the decree process, sing them. I hope they're a key lower than Mrs. Ballard songs. Uh, I don't don't know, but Alice wrote Alice wrote some music and some lyrics. And we're still trying to like get the the syllables in the right way and all that stuff. So, uh, wasn't it wasn't it Lord Hilarion that came through and helped her a lot with, with the words? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So this is what I used to get from her. She'd always say greetings. So that's why I always say greetings on my email. Uh, yeah. Okay. I always, always say, and and I always do thank you, thank you, thank you because Alice used to say it. So that was my, you know. But she would send me this little thing. She had this little typewriter that she just adored, you know, and she knew the ins and outs of that typewriter. And she would type these out. And, um, you know, we'd correspond because I was doing different things in Ohio before I moved out. I was doing um, printing of photographs, you know, the master's photos. And I was doing different things for uh, whatever I could. So uh, she would send me little notes. And it's so funny. She would say, hey, I got a feeling that you should maybe do this, or I got a feeling, and she was getting promptings, right? But you say, I got a feeling, I got a feeling, maybe you should think about this, you know? Yeah. Or I was thinking about this, you and I talked about this, and have you thought about this, you know? But I used to get little notes like this from her, so I just thought I'd show that. And then here, here's a younger me with longer hair, <laughs> and, and, and there's that picture of Alice there. And um, she had a, it's a xylophone or something, and she used it when she was writing the songbook to really get the notes out that she wanted. Mm -hmm.